Greetings, fellow mathematicians. In this video, we're going to take a look at where the Laplace transform comes from and how to properly motivate it for science, engineering, and mathematics students. If you're looking for specific examples, that's not this video. I have those in other ones. This video is more theoretical, addressing where the Laplace transform comes from. Now, most differential equations courses are going to get started with their introduction to Laplace transforms by at least first stating this formula. So let's understand that before we go any further. And it's typical for us to start first with a function of t. And we're going to think of t usually as being time. So we start with a function of time. And to calculate the Laplace transform of that function of time, we take that function, multiply it by e to the negative st, and then we integrate over t from 0 to infinity. Now, if you think back to your Calculus 2 course, we're defining the Laplace transform as an improper integral. Since we're defining it as an improper integral, there are issues of convergence. We're typically not going to spend a lot of time on those. But providing this improper integral does converge, then that function of s that we get, we call that the Laplace transform. If we think of t as being time, it's somewhat natural within science and engineering to think of s as being frequency. So what we start with is a function of time, and we get out of it at the end a function of frequency. Now, how do we arrive at this formula? That's what this video is going to address. And I find on my end, as a professor, I have kind of three options that I can use to introduce the improper integral definition for the Laplace transform. The first option is what I call the mysterious approach, which is typically, here's a formula, and it basically does magical things for us. And that is okay, but students never really get a sense or a full sense of why this integral formula is important. So I usually don't spend much time or mention at all the mysterious approach in my course. There's a second option, which is a more mathematical approach. Just right from the beginning, derive this from kind of first principles. And there are ways to do that, but I find students are left wondering, why do you want to go through these calculations to derive that? They kind of come out of nowhere, and it's kind of equally mysterious to the mysterious approach. Now, the third option that I use in my differential equations course, it's kind of an in-between. There's a little bit of mystery. We're not going to answer the complete question of where this comes from. We're not going to at least explain exactly where the e to the negative st comes from, but we will see why we want at least an integral in our definition for the Laplace transform. So, for this video, like in my differential equations course, we're going to introduce this formula basically by thinking of what are called linear operators. And we'll see naturally kind of where this formula comes from. Now, before we go into detail about linear operators, which you might have encountered if you have already completed most or all of your linear algebra course, let's kind of explain the big picture of why we're even introducing Laplace transforms at all. There's a lot of methods we have to solve first and second order differential equations. So why introduce another? The reason for that is there's a very interesting, unique way that Laplace transforms solve differential equations. To set that up and to see that, let me introduce a kind of abstract point of view where we have what I'll call a hard problem. And that's going to be what we start with. So for us, that's going to probably be a differential equation. And what 
transforms or operators do in general in mathematics is they convert from one thing to another. And what we would like to do is set up a way to convert from a hard problem, a differential equation, and convert that to an easy problem. This is a very basic problem solving strategy. Take something that is hard and convert it into something that's easy. Now how we do that conversion That's what we need to define as a transform, specifically what we're going to call a Laplace transform. So we're going to have to be able to convert in both directions. We're going to have to go from the hard problem, convert it to the easier problem. We're going to have to solve our problem over here. And then we're going to have to convert our solution back. So we're going to have to convert and transform in both directions, but we're just going to point out in this video why we want this formula to do the transformation from hard problem to the easy problem. Now let's make this a little bit more specific. This is again very abstract in general. The hard problem for us is usually going to be an ordinary differential equation where the independent variable is t. Sometimes it's x, but usually standard in a differential equations course, we're going to think of our functions as being functions of time. So what a Laplace transform will do for us is it's going to convert an ordinary differential equation in time and it's going to convert it to an easier problem in a different variable. And the variable that's usually used is s. So let's say we get an easy problem. In s. Now solving a differential equation. This involves all the tools of calculus, derivatives, integrals, etc. The easy problem here will involve ideas that don't require calculus, but we'll leave it to the rest of your differential equations course to explain what type of easy problem you'll get. All right, so in order to understand how the Laplace transform here arises, let's go into detail about what linear operators are and we're going to do so by thinking back to where you would have encountered them in Calculus 1, Calculus 2, and Linear Algebra if you've taken it. To get started with the linear operator point of view, let's point out the basic idea behind functions, operators, and transforms any place you encounter them in mathematics. The basic idea behind all three of them is you're taking something as input and converting it to something as output. Now for functions, as you first learn them, you usually took a number as your input and converted it to another number, typically a real number being converted to another real number. Operators are a little bit more general and transforms, again, a little bit more general than regular functions. So we're going to keep in mind what a Laplace transform does is we start with a function of time, t, and we convert it to the output, a function of s, a function of frequency. Now, to do this conversion, we have our improper integral definition here, but again, keep in mind, we're trying to see where this comes from. So let's go back in time to calculus one and perhaps linear algebra. Now in calculus one and likely through calculus two, when you start calculating integrals, you're using these two properties probably without even realizing it. And what these two properties say is if we have two functions, F and G multiplied by two constants, A and B, and then we add them together, 
to calculate the derivative of this, you can differentiate the functions of x, multiply them by the constants. That's basically pulling the constants in front of the derivatives. And then you just add those two results together. So in your calculus one course, this would have been a combination of the sum rule and constant multiple rule for derivatives. All right, there's a similar property for integrals or antiderivatives. Instead of differentiating, now we integrate. Again, we're gonna think of f and g as functions, a and b as constants, and the same thing happens. You can basically split this up into a sum of two different integrals. And again, you can take the constants a and b in front of the integral signs. Just like you can take constants in front of the derivatives, provided these are constant multiples. All right, now within calculus one and calculus two, these properties can be generalized into other parts of mathematics, and they all fall into a category of what are called linear transformations. Now, linear transformations aren't really fully understood until you take linear algebra which a lot of differential equation students have already completed, a lot are currently taking it, most of them will be getting to it soon anyway. So we change notation a little bit. Instead of a differential sign or an integral sign, we have a general operator, what we're gonna call a linear operator or linear transformation. And instead of functions, we have vectors u and v. And a and b, we're not gonna call them constants. It's typical to call them, instead of constants, they're called scalars. That might be familiar from your Calc 3 course, multivariable calculus course as well. Now, the way we calculate a linear transformation, it's very similar to these properties. We perform the transformation on the vectors, and you can think of functions as vectors, but that's a little bit more abstract. But we perform the transformation on the vectors or functions, and then the constants or scalars, we just multiply them and then add those two calculations together. Now, what we're trying to do is find a way to convert from our hard problem, a differential equation in T, and convert it to an easier problem in S. So how do we convert or transform from a function of one variable to a function of a different variable? Well, let's understand these first. Your two derivative and integral properties here. If you start with a function of x, the derivative is also a function of x the variable stays the same when you calculate derivatives. Same thing happens with integrals. If you integrate with respect to x, you're going to get antiderivatives where x is the variable. Now, let's introduce some notation to kind of understand how we can get to the idea of what's called a transform. Let's go ahead and see if we can define a derivative transform. So let's use different symbols here, like you might use in linear algebra. And let's suppose we wanted to define a derivative transform for a function of x. Well, we're just gonna rewrite the notation here. The way you calculate a derivative, we have product, quotient, and chain rules to do that. And if we have a function of x, f of x, we're going to write its derivative as f prime. All right, that is a very simple way to define a derivative transform, but worth pointing out, you start with a function of x and you get another function of x, the derivative. The variable stays the same. Let's suppose we were to try to define an integral transform. So instead of differentiating, we're gonna integrate. So we might write this as 
I for integrating and if we want to define a natural integral transform for a function of x, well, we might think we just integrate with respect to x. And again, the same thing happens. Start with a function of x, you're still going to have a function of x. In order to make Laplace transforms useful for solving differential equations, we have to convert from a function of one variable to a function of a different variable. Here, these derivative and integral transforms, as we've kind of introduced them, the variable stays the same. So what we need to do is to try to figure out a way, at least with an integral transform, because that's where we're heading, how do we define a transform and get the variable to change? In other words, instead of having a function of x as your input and getting a function of x as output, how do we get maybe a function of s as output here? Well, that's going to require us going into detail for what's formally known as an integral transform, which we're going to get to right now. Next, we're going to introduce a very important concept in mathematics with something called an integral transform. Now, before we do that, let's keep in mind what we're trying to do. We're trying to define a transform or some sort of transformation which takes a function of one variable and converts it to a function of a different variable. Now, if our variable in the beginning for our function is x, we can't just integrate with respect to x because we get another function of x. In order to have the variable change, we need to have two variables in our integral. At this point, it helps to have some exposure to multivariable calculus. When we integrate with respect to x, we're going to treat the other variables as constants. So if we go through this calculation, integrating with respect to x, it's likely that we're going to be left with an expression or function of y. So let's go ahead and write that, that if we integrate with respect to x, we're going to be left with y. And that gets us very close to what we want for a Laplace transform, the variable changes, but we want t and s. So right now we have a function of x converting to a different function of a different variable, a function of y. Standard notation for a Laplace transform is a function of t converting to another function of s. Well, let's just change our variables. We're just going to make a replacement, no substitutions, I'm just going to replace x with t and y with s. So let's make those replacements in this form for the integral transform. x will be replaced with t and y with s. All right, so let's go ahead and write down this new version for an integral transform, just replacing the variables. So we're taking the transform of a function of t. We're still going to integrate from a to b. But now we have our function of t multiplied by the kernel, which is now a function of t and s. And now we're converting the differential as well. dx, that's going to convert to dt. And there we go. Now, this is going to convert a function of t, and we're going to be left over after calculating this integral, a function of s, which is exactly what we want for Laplace transforms. Now, the reasons why we want to work with integral transforms, 
it's due to how regular integrals work. When we talked about or looked at earlier in this video, were those properties of integrals and derivatives, those linear properties, this definition of an integral transform is also a linear transformation. So if we go ahead and write it down, if we were to take the transform of A times F of T plus B times G of T, where F and G are functions of T, A and B are constants due to how integrals work, this is also linear. And it obeys those same linear transformation properties. All right, now this is getting us very close to understanding where a Laplace transform comes from. The only thing we need to address is what form or formula do we want for the kernel? Depending on the kernel, you get different transformations and there's two very important ones for science, engineering, and mathematics. The first, what we're addressing is a Laplace transform. And before we write down the formula for the kernel of the Laplace transform, let's again keep in mind what we are trying to do. We're not only trying to convert from a function of one variable to a function of another, but most importantly, we're trying to convert conceptually a hard problem to an easier problem. Our hard problem is a differential equation in T. So differential equations involve the tools of calculus, derivatives, and integrals. What are some simple functions that you want to differentiate and integrate? Well, exponential functions. So we're not going to fully explain it, but a reasonable place to start is let's go ahead and define our kernel as an exponential function. And we're going to define it as e to the negative st. And that gives us basically the Laplace transform this is the kernel for the Laplace transform. Now we just need to integrate it. A is going to be zero and B, we're going to take it to be infinity. So the Laplace transform, we're going to define it as an integral from zero to infinity. Perfectly fine for an integral transform that either or both A and B are infinite, positive or negative infinity. We take our function of t, multiply it by the kernel, and then integrate with respect to t. Of course, there's issues of convergence, but that's not the focus of this video. Now, the Laplace transform is one of two very important transforms you'll encounter. Some of you will be getting to the other one very soon, and it has a very similar kernel. The only change is we put a factor of 2 pi i up in that exponent of the exponential function. The other transform that is equally important is what's known as a Fourier transform. And again, the kernel is very similar. It is an exponential function, but there's an extra factor of two pi i in that exponent. So the kernel here, it's gonna be e to the negative two pi i st. And the other thing that changes from a Laplace transform to a Fourier transform is our integral now goes from negative infinity to positive infinity. So let's go ahead and write this down. because it is something that many of you will be getting to very shortly.
And there we have it. So we have our Laplace transform, we have our Fourier transform. What we didn't explain in detail is exactly why we want this precise form for the kernel. That requires a deeper, longer explanation, which I find is best left until later in your differential equations course, once you get used to working with this in the improper integral definition of the Laplace transform. So give it some time. You can explain in more detail where this comes from, but that's not, I think, appropriate for an introduction. Here, our focus was on taking properties of derivatives and integrals, thinking of them as linear transformations, and then combining it together with the idea of an integral transform. Now in your differential equations course, you'll be going into some other properties of the Laplace transform, and these properties are what makes a Laplace transform useful for solving differential equations. So I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you enjoyed kind of a nice introduction to the Laplace transform, thinking of earlier ideas and seeing why we want this form for the Laplace transform. If you enjoyed the content, support the channel, like and subscribe.